everybody and welcome to QWOC uh, Naturally Together Forum number five, I believe, Andrea. Yes, yes, it is. We're, 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 rat we're rattling through them. Yeah, excellent stuff. So uh, looking forward to a really cool session today for, for those that uh, cool. haven't been along before. Um, I, I'm Greg Vinal. I get the, the pleasure of hosting these sessions and talking to some really cool people along the way. And Andrea, of course, I'm, I'm sure most of you know, gets the uh, pleasure of organising the ball. So Andrea does the hard work and I get all the fun stuff. So thank you, Andrea, for, for organising today's session. Uh, we've got two uh, interesting guests with us today. We've got Jess Ward-Jones and, and Lyle Grieve. And uh, these guys are from The Bug Hunt, which is something that um, I don't know a lot about. So I'm looking forward to, to learning a little bit about The Bug Hunt. Now, we do have a, a couple of people in the session so far. Um, what I'll get you to do um, is, uh, you know, so you, you know, I don't think any, anyone's got their cameras on anyway, but I will get you as we go through the presentation to turn off your cameras and your microphones. And, and that way we'll get a nice clean recording to put up on the YouTube afterwards. And uh, just, the, just the speaker then needs to be on the screen. So before we start, of course, um, we'd like to um, um, acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands that we're all zooming in from today, which range from down in Victoria to way up here in far north Queensland and our guests are coming in from Canberra. So um, obviously we want to uh, pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging across all of those areas. And uh Hopefully we'll have some representatives of those uh, traditional owner groups with us today as well as the presentation goes along. Now, we do have a fairly small group today, but we also find that we tend to have a few people drift in once the session gets going. Um, so uh, hopefully we'll get a few more coming along. But what I might do is hand over now to uh, to Jess. I think, uh, Jess, are you going to start the presentation? At, yeah. And then, and then hand over to Lyle for parts of it. Is that the way it's going to work? Yes, Excellent. That's right. yeah. All right. Did you want to share your screen, Jess, and... And then I might just turn my camera off and get out of the uh, out of the view. Okay, sounds good. And leave you to do your presentation. But I'll be here if anything happens. Do you need any help? I'll be uh, lurking around in the background here. Thank you. All right. Here are my slides. Can we see that? Oh, it's loading. Just takes a second or two sometimes. I think it's a fairly big document, so. Yeah, I got a lot of books, which is fun. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Sweet. All right. Um, so we just start with whenever. Great. Um, yeah, thank you for having us here, Walk, generally. Um, my name is Jess uh, and my colleague Lyle is here. We are both from the Invasive Species Council, uh, which is a small non-for-profit um, advocacy organisation that um, advocate for better management of invasive species as one of the worst threats to Australian biodiversity. So, um, yeah, this project that we're running, the Invasive Species Council running, is called The Bug Hunt, um, and let's get stuck in. So I first thought we're a bit of a science -y crowd, um, and I just thought I'd quickly address um, the fact that I guess bugs um, isn't really a science so my first question are bugs uh, a diagram probably probably did a question um, yeah, Jess, sorry, can 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 I interrupt you there for a moment? Where your at least at my end, your audio has has broken up, so it's very very hard to understand you. Um, oh, so okay. what I might ask you to do is is actually turn your camera off. Much as we'd like to see your smiling face, it might just reduce the the bandwidth and allow the audio to be a bit cleaner. So let's give that a try. Okay, let me know if that is better. Way way better. Oh, okay, good. All right, you don't need to see my face. We've got slides. <laughs> Um, great. Okay. So everything falls into life, but which ones are bugs? Uh, if we go into domain, um, uh, I won't address that one because the different classifications of fall into domain are something about, um, kinds of cells, but bugs and actually us both fall into something called eukaryote. And inside the eukaryote, we have animals, plants, fungus, and some other funny things. Um, so bugs and also us fall into the animal category. Um, and then this is probably where you start looking at what bugs are. There's a whole group within the phylum of animals um, called arthropods. And arthropods are things that have an external skeleton. 
Um, so we have an internal skeleton, but arthropods all have a hard skeleton on the outside and all their muscles are on the inside. But then also maybe you might classify worms as bugs too. So also within there, there's a bunch of things called worms. I think there's 40 different kinds of phylums of worms. But then if we look at inside the arthropod phylum, we look at stuff that we definitely know are bugs. So we've got insects and spiders and crabs, maybe springtails, centipedes, millipedes, etc. And then just to get even more confusing, one group within insects is called the hemipterans, and that's what we call true bugs. So bugs is up to you as to which one you want to call those things, but um, I guess it's the group of crawlies that we find interesting and have a very important role in our ecology. So I guess, I mean, I just love bugs generally, but um, I just want to point out quickly how important they are and how many of them there are. So if we look at um, the general diversity of kingdoms of animals um, we can see that arthropods just that one small group make up more than half of species diversity so there are so many different kinds of bugs in the world um, and then if you just even look at insects there are oops sorry about that there are more insects species of insects of, than any other kind of thing in the world so there is a lot to know and then if we zoom in even further and we look at bugs in Australia, we have a huge diversity. Um, invertebrate animals make up about 55% of all known Australian species diversity and more than 90% of Australian animal diversity is invertebrates. And they're absolutely critical to the functioning of our ecosystems. They provide pollination services, they're food for other animals, they nutrient cycle, biotubating, and they create, even create other habitat for other animals. And little is known about many of these species. Um, we think there's probably about 200,000 species of invertebrates that we don't even know um, to be discovered in Australia yet. So lots to know. But as well as lots of lovely um, native invertebrates that I've got on the screen here, we also have invasives. I'll quickly show you some of my favorites. On the top right, we have a teddy bear bee. Um, I don't recommend holding it like that, but it is a native one. <laughs> In the middle, we've got a, on the top, um, we've got a spiny leaf insect, which makes lovely pets. Uh, Christmas beetles on the left, quite common. A Cairns bird wing from up north. Um, and then these lovely spiders down the bottom, there's a peacock spider, uh, which are known for doing very interesting little dances. Um, and then this Gippsland giant worm, which I would love to see one day. So there's so lots of interesting bugs in Australia, but there are also invasive species, which we know are concerning. So I will hand over to my colleague Lyle now, and he's going to touch on why we're worried about invasive insects there. Thank you, Jess. Lyle Grieve here. Um, thank you for the introduction. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Yes. Thank you, Jess. Sounds good. We've got a little bit of a delay. Sorry, everyone. It's um, I think Jess is calling in from from Melbourne at the moment. Um, all good. So I'm just going to do a little oh, bit of a background to give the um, the bigger picture sort of view and how the Bug Hunt project fits in and kind of like what are the bigger goals that we're trying to achieve by by doing this work. Um, so I won't go into too much detail about this. This can get a little bit um, a bit uh, bureaucratic and and governmenty. So I'll keep it I'll keep it to be high level. Um, but I'm sure most of you would be aware of how harmful invasive insects can be, let alone other types of invasives like uh, vertebrate uh, predators like feral cats and foxes. Um, insects are, are some of the highest risk invasives and some of the reasons why they are so high risk is because of how small they are, um, how they can hitchhike their way into people's baggage, into machinery, even hiding in the wheel wells of new cars as they get imported into Australia. So they're very, very good at slipping through uh, checks and, and um, inspections and getting into places that they shouldn't be. Um, they also are really, really quick to reproduce and to grow in numbers, um, which is you know a, a, a big factor in invasiveness. Um, and the effects that they have if they get here are, are pretty catastrophic. Um, so some of the invasive insects will actually attack and kill native animals. Um, they outcompete all of our native insects. They carry diseases that spread through crops and um, native plants. Um, and um, and also, yeah, target our Australian plants. Um, so as we'd all agree, we want to do everything we possibly can to keep uh, any new invasive insects from entering Australia um, and to invest what we need to invest to control and eradicate the ones that have already got here. 
Um, one of the key things in looking out for these invasive insects is adequate surveillance. So I'll go into a little bit more detail about what that means and how it relates, but, um, but it's one piece of the puzzle. So good surveillance at the start, being prepared, having, having a response plan in place, doing the proper risk assessments um, so that we understand what are the risks, where they come from, what pathways to look at in detail and so on. Um, so yes, uh, Jess, next slide, please. Hello, Jess. Next slide, please. I'm not controlling it. Hello, did that go to me? Oh. <laughs> yep, all good. Thank you. Sorry, there's a delay. Um, so just touch on a little bit as an example here. Um, we have a pest in WA. It's called the very catchy name of Polyphagus shot hole borer. Polyphagus just means that it eats lots of different types of plants. Um, it's not a, not a fussy eater. Um, and when you find it on a tree, it looks like somebody shot the tree with a shotgun. So that's kind of where that catchy name comes from. Um, they're also known as ambrosia beetles, which is a little bit easier to remember. Um, so we believe that this insect got into Perth um, through the port. Uh, there's no real consensus on when um, or, or from where. Um, it's just taken quite a few years for people to spot them. Um, but it was only spotted by the general public, seeing some strange holes in, in trees and calling up the government and saying, um, you know, something's going on here, what's going on? They then sent out their inspector and, and found that this is a, a real bad outbreak. So they're currently trying to control that outbreak spread beyond the suburbs of Perth uh, because the impact could be pretty drastic. It's, uh, it's known to kill um, or severely infect um, some of our native trees. So a lot of the myrtle family, wattles in particular, um, but also the Morton Bay fig is one that they will target as well. So the, the potential impact of this tiny little thing, and you can see how incredibly small and, and um, hard to see they are, um, can be really huge. We, we actually don't really understand what impact um, this bug is going to have, but also it highlights how important it is that everybody is out there looking um, for bugs that are unusual. Um, and that sort of links into the importance of, of surveillance for insects and bug hunt project. So next slide, Jess. So I'll just talk a little bit about the importance of this in terms of our biodiversity. So everybody understands biosecurity and how it works on the border. Um, it's a system that's been put together and it's a, and it's a strong system. It's a, it's a good system, um, but it's definitely focusing on protecting our agricultural productivity over things like the environment. So it's only recently that we've sort of started to be more aware of how important our biosecurity system is to protect our environment. A lot of the functions of the system by default protect our environment by stopping in invasive environmental pests as well as agricultural pests. Um, but I think the significance of how important biosecurity uh, is for environmental uh, protection uh, really just needs to be emphasized more and, and more familiar with everybody in Australia. So here's just some some very depressing stats, I'm, I'm sorry, um, about how important they are. So there's been a recent huge UN uh, multi-year research project that just came out and um, it was looking at the impacts of invasive species globally. And as you can see, 80%, uh, uh, sorry, 60% of global plant and animal extinctions have been due to, or in part at least um, due to invasive species. So that, that really shows us that invasive species impacts is just as important for conservation as climate change impacts and deforestation. It's all connected and they all interact, um, but it is critically important if we are to prevent further extinctions. In Australia context, over 80% of um, our extinctions were caused by invasives, um, and it's predicted to be the driver, primary driver of 85% of the next round of extinctions. Um, that we now have more introduced plants in Australia than there are native species, which is a very sad statistic. Um, but yeah, stopping this from happening and addressing what's here is, is what we call environmental biosecurity. But it's not a formal term, it's all just part of the biosecurity system. So one of the things that we're trying to do is, is increase and promote the importance of the environmental aspect of the biosecurity system. We need it to be better funded and more prioritized to address these risks to our, to our biodiversity. It also has other significant impacts. So indigenous land management and culture are severely impacted by invasives. Um, all you need to do is look at the changes in, um, in fire regimes up north through grasses like amber grass. 
um, and the loss of totemic animals um, and the inability to manage land as, um, as uh, would have been done traditionally. Um, they can also impact on everyone's quality of life. So for example, we have some really bad ants. You would be very aware of the bad ants in Queensland. Um, unfortunately, you've, uh, you've copped a number of them over the last couple of decades. And um, you're probably well aware of the impact that they can have, you know, the, the stings that the red fire ant can give people are, are horrible um, and can really impact on the ability to, you know, have a barbecue or go out in a park with your bare feet or, you know, things like that. It can be really, really significant. Next slide, Jess. So just to talk in economic costs, which is the, you know, as you know, the language of, of government and a lot of um, decisions are made based on that. You can see that the globally it costs us $400 billion a year just managing the impacts of invasives. That's that's very significant amount of expenditure. Um, the costs are quadrupling every decade, um, which is pretty scary. Um, it's also looking at the the value of what we already do in Australia. So our biosecurity system is saving us. It's It's worth $300 billion dollars. Um, so far um, over the last 50 years in terms of value um, based on agriculture alone. So that's not even considering um, those other aspects like environmental value, um, conservation value, um, or human health and, um, and culture. So in a nutshell, investing early, investing in prevention, in surveillance, in preparedness is a return on our investment 30 to 1 rather than letting things get in and then trying to eradicate. Um, the, the cost is vastly more um, if you let things get in. Thank you, Jess. This is a good graph, just shows that sort of global picture. Um, I won't stay on this for too long, but it just goes to show how important this is globally and how, how we all need to work together um, to address this risk. Next slide. So our Australian government, the federal government, maintains lists of key pests. Uh, the one that is of interest to us is known as the EPL, um, as an acronym, um, but it's actually the National Priority List of Exotic Environmental Pests, Weeds and Diseases, quite a mouthful. Um, it currently contains 168 exotic species, which have been assessed as having significant environmental or social risk to Australia. Uh, they are marine, terrestrial, vertebrate, invertebrate, everything. It's not comprehensive and it needs to be expanded. Um, and the pests that are listed on there often don't come with a good level of understanding or knowledge of what the impacts might be if they got to Australia. So there's quite a lot of work to be done um, so that we're not caught uh, underprepared. And this is where surveillance is the critical tool. So we don't have them, we don't want them, but how do we know if they get in? One of the more positive aspects on this, and, I, and we've included this to try not to be too depressing because a lot of the invasive species um, uh, information is a little bit, you know, it's a bit scary, but um, we can achieve good things. This is, this is a success story on eradicating um, invasive species. We can overcome the challenges that they pose when you're looking at a contained environment. So islands are perfect, perfect case studies for testing technologies, for showing the benefits of, of getting rid of um, invasives for biodiversity, showing the regeneration that can happen. Um, we've got some really great case studies in Australia, let alone the world, of island eradications. Here's just a couple. Um, Macquarie Island, they got rid of the um, invasive herbivores, so rabbits and goats were eradicated. They also got rid of um, rats as well. You can see a little picture here of the before and after. That's native vegetation that's come back. Um, and that's um, just in a matter of years once that program was was achieved. So that's an incredible um, success story. On Lord Howe Island, they got rid of uh, rodents um, and saw a, I can't remember the exact stat, but it was something like a thousand percent um, increase in uh, native vegetation and animals being found again after that eradication. Um, one of the important things to do um, in combination of the eradication is ongoing surveillance and protecting that environment now that that investment has been made. So, for example, Lord Howe Island still gets incursions of rodents because it is very close to the, the mainland and you get a lot of the tourism happening around it. So rats and, and, and mice do get found, but it's got a much stronger biosecurity system in place to protect the work that's been done. So it's not all bad. We have some success stories and we can achieve eradication. Next slide. So biosecurity is everybody's responsibility. So there's something that is really amazing about the way that our neighbor New Zealand does this. They have a, a brand um, that is basically just called This Is Us. It's an identity of New Zealanders where biosecurity is part of being a New Zealander. Um, so everybody understands it. 
And I think that we're getting there in Australia as well. Um, but I think there's there's more work to be done in that area and more inclusion of, of the general public beyond what governments do. Um, so we're moving into that space at the moment. We're talking about shared responsibility um, in biosecurity management. We're talking about things like the general biosecurity duty, which is a concept, uh, a legal concept in legislation where industry, uh, agriculture, the general public, tourism, all have a legal uh, responsibility to do their due diligence when it comes to biosecurity. So it's having a, a basic understanding. It's applying best practice, uh, reporting things that that shouldn't be there, um, cleaning boats, doing doing all those sorts of activities that that should be part of the the general operation of these businesses. But it just makes it a little bit more of an you own that responsibility and take take responsibility for introducing risk to Australia, basically. One of the key things about that shared responsibility is how can we all take part in surveillance? So surveillance in biosecurity is looking out for things that shouldn't be here. It's a, it's a simple concept. It gets complicated when you start to talk about targeted versus general surveillance. So targeted surveillance is the scientific, uh, specific looking at a certain thing, looking at a certain pathway, using a specific targeted tests like a genetic eDNA or um, you know some sort of chemical diagnostic or pheromone traps um, you know etc general surveillance is is gathering information from many sources not necessarily scientific or targeted uh, just keeping a keeping an eye out basically and and picking up anything that shouldn't shouldn't be there one of the most important parts of general surveillance and what we're trying to do is how can citizen science better fit into the biosecurity surveillance that we need. We have basically an army of millions of people who could be looking um, in Australia, and it's just about how to tap into that, um, how to get people in, engaged. It's very hard sometimes to get interest in something when you're trying to find zero. You're trying to be you know, unsuccessful in your, in your hunt, um, but that's, that's part of what this project is doing. It's testing these sorts of concepts, and Jess will go into a lot more interesting detail about that shortly. Next slide. Great, and that's me. Thank you very much, Thank Niall. you, Jess. All that context. I'm just going to check. Um, does my audio sound okay? It's a bit glitchy, but it's okay. I can yeah, it. it's a little bit hit and miss, okay. but yep, we'll, we'll persevere. Okay. okay, sorry about that. I'm not sure what happened. Um, I'll try and go slow so it doesn't come <laughs> out. <laughs> um, yeah, so great. Thank you, Lyle. So I think what Lyle has highlighted is there is a, there's sort of an opportunity there. We know that general surveillance works and we know that there there is a, a niche there that we could fill. So where does citizen science fit into general surveillance? Um, citizen science specifically is the collection and analysis of data relating to the natural world by members of the general public. Um, often there is a specific question and sometimes it's just general. Um, and there are many examples of citizen science, even particularly in Australia, um, where citizen science has been very successful, uh, mainly for native species. Um, one that many people would be familiar with is the BirdLife Aussie Backyard Bird Count, uh, which is running very soon, I think. Um, hundreds of thousands of data points come in every year about birds that are um, just in and out of rural areas and, and um, metro areas. Another one that ACF runs is the Platypus Project, getting more data about where these beautiful animals exist. Um, an interesting one in Tasmania is about where wedge-tailed eagles are. Um, and many of these kinds of data projects and many others all feed into the Atlas of Living Australia which is a online portal of data, which uh, has many, many sources. It's managed by the National Science Agency, CSIRO, and it's open source. So anyone can access that data and scientists are using that real data all the time. And we know, so we've seen examples of um, citizen science working really well and having real outcomes um, for native biodiversity. Um, we know that of the total 115 million species records that have been submitted to the Atlas of Living Australia, about half of those come from citizen science. There's a really interesting um, article that came out last week about it in the conversation, if you're interested. 
So our question is, can we broaden that net or ask a more specific question about invasive insects? Um, we know that it's been successful for natives um, and there are examples of when um, invasive species monitoring by citizen scientists has been um, really uh, successful. So 70% of red imported fire ants in Southeast Queensland comes from citizen scientists. Uh, we know that incursions of African cardaby and black slugs, uh, which were concerning species, were detected by just really random um, submissions of pictures of bugs that were uploaded to Facebook groups. And they were the very first detections of those things. So this is a question that we are asking, and we have partnered with the Federal Department of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries to see if we can answer this question. Um, is can we get more people looking for bugs, bad bugs and good bugs, but particularly interested in the bad bugs. And we're calling it the bug hunt. Here it is. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about it and um, how you guys can take part. Um, and I guess the outcomes and the reasons that we're interested in it is um, basically more data is more better. I'm not sorry about that sentence, but um, Having more data coming in just means we know a bit more about those species. Um, for example, here is one species that falls within that EPOL list that Lyle told us about. Uh, this is Apis serrana, which is the Asian honeybee. Um, it's known to have exist in and around the Cairns area, um, and it seems to be spreading, but uh, at the moment we only have 80 records for it, and there, there's probably more than 80, so um, there is definitely opportunity there to know a bit more. Um, we have an opportunity to get more eyes on the ground um, just to broaden that security by security net. And really, I mean, all we're asking um, and hoping that people will do is just to get outside and take pictures of bugs, <laughs> which is fun. So um, it's definitely a learning opportunity. And um, the platform that we are encouraging people to use is really reasonably straightforward. Um, and it has lots of interesting facts about those bugs that, that you can learn. Um, so which bugs are we focusing on? Um, Lyle mentioned that list of um, uh, pests that are particularly of interest. So we've chosen a few target um, species that we know um, have potential to be accessible um, because of their ecology um, and whether they're big and recognizable. And I'll walk you through those now. So a few of the ants, in, uh, sorry, species that we're particularly looking for um, are yellow crazy ants. Uh, if you live in far north Queensland, you'll be familiar with these guys. Um, they are established in around Cairns area uh, in Townsville, and there's been a recent incursion in the Whit Sundays. They're very small, um, but they have a voracious appetite, and they spray acid at basically any living thing they encounter. So. Uh, Lyle and I recently visited some properties that had yellow crazy ant incursions and they described their properties, which were in beautiful forests, lush forests. Um, they described that area as silent because these ants will spray acid at and then um, basically eat or kill or drive out all um, other insects, birds, lizards, frogs, even small mammals as well. So we are on the hunt for yellow crazy ants. We're also on the hunt for electric ants. Um, I think Lyle's got a few facts on electric ants if he wants to pop in there. Sure thing. Yes. No. So electric ants are uh, another type of tramp ant that is really, uh, really of high concern. Um, anyone who's been up at Cairns might have encountered the eradication program that's going on. So electric ants were listed on that national pest list as a as an exotic pest of concern. And when they were detected in 2006, uh, that triggered the national response agreement. So all the governments of Australia can um, cost share the eradication process. So that's the ideal outcome when the system works. Um, and I believe that the eradication has been going on really well um, and they're making inroads. They've gotten rid of most of the surrounding uh, little outbreak areas, and it's mostly down to a few of the original outbreak around the Cairns area. Um, and I think that that is going well, and they're predicting a full eradication success as long as the activity continues and everybody keeps their, their eyes out. Um, so, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Another good news story. <laughs> um, a, another potential good news story, but currently not sure. Um, fire ants also, there is an incursion of fire ants in and around the Brisbane area. Um, you may have heard about it in the news because one of our colleagues um, is working very hard about making lots of noise about that one. But these ants are another kind of tramp ant um, that are native to South America. Um, 
glut of concern. They're omnivores. They prey on invertebrates and vertebrates. They eat plants and honeydew. They're very aggressive and have a very venomous sting that they use to kill their prey, uh, which are very uncomfortable if you get stung by one also. Um, they swarm in huge numbers and can attack even large animals, even though they're very small, about two to six millimetres. Um, so, yeah, keep an eye out for these ones. Um, we know in the USA uh, they've uh, had a huge outbreak um, and it causes something around 85 deaths in total they've had and it costs them $6.5 billion a year trying to manage these guys. So we want to watch out for fire ants too. Um, we're also on the lookout for snails. Um, this one is called giant African snail. This one has previously um, entered Australia, but been detected and eradicated, but not currently known. Um, I think this one's probably a good one because it's pretty hard to miss. Um, if you saw that one, you'd probably know. Uh, they can grow to the size of a small rabbit, uh, but they are known to feed on basically any plant they find. They'll eat vegetables, they'll eat ornamental plants, banana crop, citrus, even native forests. So looking out for giant African snails, sometimes known as gas. <laughs> and there's a few other kinds of snails in there. Um, the one in the middle is called the golden or the channel apple snail. Um, it is an aquarium snail, so it's very pretty, apparently in your aquarium. Um, but it's a freshwater snail and it would spread very easily into our water systems. And there's been a few detections of them, but keeping an eye out for them. Um, some other interesting ones there. There's one called the rosy predator snail. Uh, apparently it's sometimes called the wolf snail because it'll chase down other kinds of native snails which you don't want. But uh, we call this the bug hunt. Um, it's not just about the scary invasives. Um, we also would love to know about while you're out and about and you just snap whatever bug you find. Here's some highlights that I love. Uh, this is on the left, a native snail called the Atherton Tableland Bicolored Snail. It's the biggest native snail that we have in Australia. And I found that one in a forest somewhere near Cairns. Another highlight that I love, if you happen to be traveling and you get to Mount Capitar in New South Wales, this is called the Mount Capitar Pink Slug and it's only found on that mountain, which is cool. We are also on the lookout for bees. Um, many of the bees we are looking for on that list are called uh, are in the Apis genus, which is actually the same genus that the honeybees that we know and are familiar with fall within. Um, but many of these Apis species, though they look the same, um, there's some examples of how they all look, <laughs> um, they do behave differently. So they're there is a fear that they would outcompete the bees that we already have. Um, they don't really make honey, um, and they would also have potential to carry the varroa mite, which we're concerned about. It's already spreading through New South Wales too. Um, and then there's something called an Africanized honeybee, which is basically a hybrid of a subspecies that is almost this exactly the same as a honeybee that we already have, but has a gene for being really aggressive. So we don't want those ones. But then we also have so many lovely kinds of native bees. So if you're out and about and you see um, a bee that looks like a bee, but you think it's a bit different, um, native Australian bees come in all different shapes and sizes. Um, there are more than 200 native bees, native bees in Australia. Um, and one of my favorites on the left is called the blue banded bee. Um, it's quite big, could be up to two centimeters. They're solitary bees, uh, but at night all the males will come and they will rest on a stick and sleep on a stick together, which I think is lovely. <laughs> um, another bee that I love um, is called a carpenter bee. Um, again, it's solitary. It's really quite big, a bit like a bumblebee, um, but they sleep, they make holes and they sleep inside um, xanthoria or grass tree stalks, as you can see on the right there. So they'd be lovely to come across. And when you're, so there's a, um, ants, bees, and snails we're particularly interested in, but really we're just interested in any kinds of bugs you can find, snap a pick, um, and the bug hunt is about learning about what you find around you. Um, and I'll show you in a second how you can do that. But here's some other examples of bugs I've seen around. There's a harlequin beetle, they're all up the East Coast. This is a mountain catadint, actually really only exists um, in the Alpine areas down in New South Wales and Victoria. Um, one of my favorites on the left, that's a Cyclone Larry stick insect. Um, it was discovered near Cairns after Cyclone Larry came through because the winds just dropped them all on the floor. <laughs> and that was the first time anyone had seen them. Um, another of my 
favorites is a net casting spider. Um, it makes its own net, but then it also makes sort of like a little fishing net with its legs. And that's how it catches things. Some beautiful butterflies. Um, this is a green grocer cicada, which you may find in Southeast Queensland. Uh, it's one of the loudest insects in the world. It can yell up to 120 decibels. <laughs> Uh, we've got bumblebees. Um, this actual bumblebee species isn't native, but it's not problematic. Um, this one only lives in Tasmania, and then there's all kinds of different beetles that exist around Australia waiting to be snapped. So now that we know that there's plenty of bugs for us to find and there's plenty of reasons to do it, if you'd like to take part in the bug hunt, it's pretty straightforward. Um, we are encouraging people to download this app called iNaturalist. Um, we haven't invented it, but it's run by, um, uh, it's an independent app. Uh, we like it because it has a great interface. And the best thing about it is that it uses a photo recognition software um, to figure out what you've got. So you don't need to be an expert at all. You can let the app do all the work and all you have to do is take a pic. So how does it work? Uh, while you're out and about doing your thing, you snap a picture of some bugs, you upload it. Even if you don't know what it is, you could just say like, oh, a worm. <laughs> Um, or you can let the uh, photo recognition do the work. And then lots of experts that exist um, on that app and love recognizing things will come and check. Um, you can talk about these things if you want. And then all that same data that you found on species across Australia will go to the Atlas of Living Australia, that portal that we talked about earlier. Um, so just in a little bit more detail, I'll show you how easy it is. Um, all you have to do once you've downloaded iNaturalist and made yourself an account, is you just find that picture that you um, found of a bug. This one in particular is of ants. And then you would click that button that says, what did you see? Um, and then that photo recognition would have a go at guessing. And then the location and the time automatically populates. Uh, this is not an ant, clearly. But uh, when you find something, um, this is the kind of interface that you see. So a couple of facts, some links to some more, some pictures to have a look and then also a, a um, distribution of records of where you might find that species. So it's a fun learning thing too. Uh, and then once you've taken a whole bunch of records, you'll end up with a profile a bit like this. This is my one. Um, this same app doesn't just work on bugs. You can use it on plants. You can even use it on animals, but we're particularly interested in bugs, but feel free to use it on flowers too. And you can see on the right, uh, where those comments are and there's a couple of them there's a red one i haven't seen yet um that is where the experts are checking out what you found and debating whether they think it's that one or not and you don't have to do anything <laughs> but you can join in the chat if you like and then um there is a video on how you can join this part but this is where we're putting all our data into the invasive species council bug hunt um, and this is where we're collating our data. You can see lots of people are submitting records on bees and butterflies um, and keeping up for snails too, which is great. So if you're interested um, in snapping some bugs, um, there's our website, there's a QR code, and we will also be sending out um, some more information on how you can take part and look out for some bugs uh, via Queensland Water and Land Cares, you guys. So thank you very much. Um, to close, here is one of my favorite bugs. This is a velvet worm. Um, it doesn't have eyes, but it sprays slime out the side of its face. <laughs> um, also, if you're really keen and you would like to have some more resources to motivate your groups, um, we'll be sending out, we can send out some bug hunt packs with some more information, some fun patches. Uh, we've got some merch with magnifying glasses. We've got coloring in stuff and all kinds of things. So in that same email that we'll send out, um, you can sign up and say, yes, please send me some stuff. And we would love to send it to you. So thank you for listening and tuning in to learn about the bugs. Um, please let me know if you have any questions. I look forward to seeing your pictures. And thanks. Well, thank you, Jess, for that that presentation. And obviously we do have a couple of questions and comments that have come up in the chat. So I'll. Uh, I'll make sure that they're addressed in, in just a moment. But uh, just amazing to hear some of the stats about the the extent of invasive. And sorry, I forgot to turn my camera on, but the the extent of um, 
and, and a number of invasive species that we're, we're now dealing with. And amazing to see how technology is advanced. We now have apps like this that are obviously using AI to enable citizen scientists to very easily get involved in, in tracking down and and monitoring for and preventing the, the spread of these um, these species. So um, the, the app, Jess, where can we get that? Do we need to go to the, the App Store or the Google Play Store or, or from the website that you've just given us details of? Yeah, so you can do it on your um, Android or your Apple phone now. All you have to do is go to your Play Store, type in iNaturalist. Yep. Um, it should be the first one that comes up. Make yourself an account. Um, and then if you head to our website, I've got some videos there on how um, just walking you through the steps on on how to log in and how to set yourself up. Terrific, terrific. And go on, incentivize your kids to go and take some photographs too. It's always good to have an army of kids <laughs> running around snapping bugs. So terrific right. stuff. Now, yeah, let me... The chat's just disappeared off my screen, so let me see if I can get it up again. Oh. It, there were a couple of questions there that I needed to um, bring to your attention, but it seems to have... Oh, okay. uh, so Andrea... with the... Would you like me to read some? If you could, please. Yeah, I can't get it back on my screen. I don't know why it's disappeared. Or Deborah may be able to ask them herself if she wants to. Yeah, because yep. She was yep. talking That'll be about fine how too, to yep. do this without a smartphone. Okay, so yeah, I had two questions. Um, the first one, like in mentioning the Asian honeybee, which I understand is now at management capacity, they're not trying to eradicate it up here. Um, when I did actually find some bees in my yard and I wanted to try to have somebody tell me, are these Asian honeybees or not? It was extremely difficult to find anybody. Um, so in the long run, I, I finally got put onto a beekeeper who wasn't too far from where I was located, who was willing to drive 45 minutes to get to me. And when he arrived, he was able to identify that they weren't Asian honeybees. But that was a real problem because these bees are causing problems in the Cairns area. Nobody's eradicating them. Um, but when you try to even get them identified, it's really hard. So that, that was a... I guess maybe a critique that I had that we need more people available to identify the pest species uh, mm -hmm. locally so that that information can be confirmed. And then the other one was that I, I do use our naturalist occasionally through a normal desktop account. So with the way that you've got your app set up, if I go through a normal desktop account, how do I get any of my bug photos to be incorporated into your program? Okay, yes. Um, so all the functionality that exists in the app on your phone will also be online. So if okay. you just upload um, any photo that you're taking with the camera, um, you can also upload it onto a desktop portal as well. Sometimes it's a bit easier because there's a oh, okay. screen to work with. Um, okay. uh, although, yeah, if you do that, um, you might have to manually um, locate it because uh, it might not automatically fill but if you know where you take it then you can just move the map around and see where that was um and the comment about people um struggling to identify them um mm -hmm. i definitely am aware of that and i was told that by experts um the great thing or maybe it could be a great thing about the app is that the more pictures that go in the better the um, algorithm gets um, so the more pictures you're taking, the, the better it can get. Um, I was like, oh, no, it's not going to work. And then um, I actually was in Cairns and I saw an Asian honeybee at the market. And I was like, I think that's what it is. And I took a picture and it got it straight away. So I was very impressed. Um, but, yeah, if you can get a clear photo, there's lots of people in there that can have a debate. So. Right. Okay. All right. And obviously with, um, with an AI app, I mean, you, you go to photograph a bug, the bug's moving around, it's going from flower to flower, and you, yeah. you take 20 pictures of it yeah. to try to get one that's in focus. Yeah. What, and also the angle, are you trying to get it from the side, are you trying to get it from the back? Are there specific guidelines as to what should be in the composition of the photo in order for the AI program to pick up on it? Yeah, well, actually, in the app, um, just for one record, you can upload multiple photos. You can even put all the blurry ones into if you wanted. Um, and it is amazingly able to recognize which part of the bug that is. Um, obviously, oh, right. clearer is better, um, but, it, but it works with what it's got. Um, and I guess it sort of depends on the bug too. So I know specifically for Asian honeybees, they are a bit smaller than an, um, honey, a normal European honeybee. Um, they have a bit darker coloring, so it's the kind of thing that you can see around their face. But um, the AI is quite impressive. <laughs> right. Okay. All right. Thank you. It's actually, and I haven't seen them for a while, but I think the um, National Geographic shop used to have a little 
device you could actually put over the bug that your phone camera lens then went over the top of it so you could hold the bug still long enough to get a good photograph of it. So I'm not sure if they're still available. Yeah, so yeah and um, they closed in Cairns. Yeah, <laughs> they did close in Cairns, yes, yes. But no, no doubt if they have them, they'll be online. So um, Thomas had a question as well. Thomas, did you want to um, turn on your microphone and ask a question in person? I just, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, question is, is this all just true terrestrial stuff or, you know, seashore marine sort of sightings you want as well, you know, rocky headlands, all that sort of thing is, I assume it's everywhere we're going that you want us to record these sightings. Yeah, I mean, really, it's anywhere you're interested in going. Um, there are marine pests on those lists. We haven't uh, mentioned them here, but uh, there are definitely marine pests that uh, the government and we are interested in. So, yeah, if you're out there, um, that would be great. <laughs> And aquatic freshwater beasties as well, Jess. Are they coming up? Yep, they're yep. all their game. Terrific. Yeah. Yep. So, do we have a question there? I saw a hand raised. Hello. Sorry, we can't. We can't hear you. You might be muted. Let me have a have a look. I don't see a thing. <laughs> That's right. No worries. Can we, if 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 we can't get your microphone to work, did you just want to type something into the chat and I can ask Jess for you? Cool. All right. So there's another question coming. Um, Jess and Lyle, another another question that I had for you. My my daughter a couple of years ago participated in a, a bit of a bug hunt. It wasn't part of this program, but it was a similar type of thing where the kids were out snapping photographs and there were hundreds of kids snapping photographs around cans looking for specifically at ants. And, and, and the program was to find crazy ants. And that program was kind of incentivized and turned into a game. And so these kids were actually competing with each other. And there was it actually got lots and lots of engagement. Lots of kids got really enthusiastic and they're all trying to win prizes. Is there any kind of plan to do that with the, the bug hunt program? Definitely got room for that. It, within the app, actually, it has a whole leaderboard system. So it's okay. not hmm. yeah. pretend incentivized. <laughs> yeah, so we, um, we, could, we could potentially then create some localised, you know, like... We could get school yeah. teachers to, to create a, a a competition within their class or something like that or within the school. I think so. Yeah, um, okay. yeah we've got really fun merch and um, I gave out some funny ant hats to some people in cans as well. So, um, yeah, if you guys are from particular groups and you have some ideas, please let me know if you want to talk to your um, your groups and we can we can workshop something. I'd sure, to yeah. That. And pre perhaps if you want to stick around online after this as well, I might um, put you in touch with the people that ran that. That, that program too. It might be good to connect you. Great. Cool. Do we have any other questions coming? How did you go there? You didn't get that question into chat. Um, couldn't see that one. But, um, also, how do you take email? Oh, questions? there it is. Here we go. So where do we access the support material is the question. Oh, great. Okay. Well, um, if you type in bug hunt uh, in Basie Species Council, it'll be the first one that comes up. Um, or next week, I think Andrea and I are planning to get an email out to everyone on the QWALK mailing list as well. So that's more information. Yep. Excellent. All right. Well, I think um, we, we're probably starting to run out of questions now. So I'd, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank Jess and Lyle for an awesome presentation, if not a slightly scary presentation at times. <laughs> Some of those statistics were a little bit horrifying to me. And then, um, but, you know, maybe we need a bit of a, a wake up call as well. And this might be just the way to do it. So uh, thank you so much for coming along and, and sharing the, the program with us. Uh, and, and I'm excited to see the, the use of AI and, and making citizen science so accessible and, and so helpful to you know, what's a, a major problem that we've, we're now dealing with. So thank you. And thank you to everybody who's come along to this program. And Andrea, uh, thank you for organising the, the session today as well and look forward to the next one in due course. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, um, Greg, for running that. Thanks, Jess and Lyle, for um, supporting the QWOP online forums. Uh, fantastic to have you along. And as Jess said, uh, Queensland Water and Land Carers will be doing quite a bit of promotional work around this. So if you're following our socials or whatever, hopefully some more um, information will come out. Terrific stuff. All right.
Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you at the next session. Thank you Bye. so very much. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 So, Jess, the, the program that my daughter was involved in was uh, was run by a company called Questacon. Uh, sorry, Questa Game. Have you come across those guys at all? Yes, I do know Questa Game. Okay, yes. good. Yeah, okay. I think they're great. I, think I, I probably don't need to connect you then, but yeah, and, Andrew oh. Robinson. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So he, and he's based up here in Cairns as well, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, yeah, but he, he was basically, they got Cairns Council to fund the the um quest that my daughter was involved in so um the council put up some money for the prizes and, and all that kind of stuff and yeah they had they had hundreds of kids involved uh, which is fantastic yeah, so and i think he's got about fifty thousand people now uh worldwide in in that program that are submitting data so yeah and photographs yeah that's a good idea prizes are always fun so maybe yeah. i need to know how i can, how I, can. <laughs> <laughs> I think i think you'd find fairly easily sponsors and, and organizations that would put up prizes for for that sort of thing, but yeah. I suppose the question is whether or not you're going to run that as part of your thing or whether that's a, something that you could suggest to groups as part of your kit maybe is that, you know, mm. you could games and how to run games and is it Questacon, Great. No, Quest Game. Questacon is the Science game. Museum in Canberra. Quest of Games <laughs> is, the, is the, bit, the, name of, the name of the business, yeah. So he's a Cairns-based Cairns guy and his wife. And they've built an app and they've got a bunch of, um, you know, um, invertebrate specialists who are sitting behind the scenes doing a lot of the ID stuff. So I don't think their AI is at the point that your AI is. Uh, I think it's more sort of humans, you know, involved in identifying the, the bugs from the from the photographs, yeah. You could certainly use it, that model. It was one that we um, considered, but I think the kind of, we want it to be really accessible and like free. Um, yeah. And INAT is actually runs out of um, it's like Silicon Valley in California, um, okay. so data they're coming from is worldwide. So it's like pretty comprehensive in terms of shapes of bugs and stuff. So yeah, yep. yeah, that's a really cool program. A any um, plans to include fish? No, you can use it on fish. You can use it on anything. Can? Okay, <laughs> it works cool. on anything. Cool. Um, yep. it's really great. It has an incredible amount of data feeding in, um, mm. and it goes straight to the ALA, which is amazing. Um, so yeah. Terrific. Crazy. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you very much for coming along and, and I really enjoyed the presentation. It's great to meet you. Thanks so All much. Right. Thanks, 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 Greg. Yeah. Thanks, Jess. Catch right. you later. Bye, guys. See ya.